if you think about a tree like a series of straws facing upwards like this, there's always wood movement because your straws are absorbing moisture and letting moisture go. So if you have a look at wood movement, it happens because of how wood is cut. That's probably the most important factor or the biggest reason why wood moves. One of the things to consider when you're making furniture, you've got to account for this thing called wood movement. Wood is never dead. People think that once you've chop the tree down, it stops doing what trees do, it stops growing and stops doing things. But it actually never stops letting moisture out and bringing moisture back in. It just never stops doing that. Oh. In South Africa, most of the wood that we cut, we cut in a way that is with a bandsaw mill and we cut slices out of a log like this. So you'll see basically you have a log and then you just cut a whole lot of slices out of it. And you'll notice that different parts of this tree give you different kinds of ring patterns, if you like. The three major categories of how stuff is sawn is flat sawn. So you can see that would have been the center of the tree over there. So that's flat sawn where your grain or your circles go like that. Then you have what we call rift sawn, which is where your grain is more of a 45 degree angle, like that. And then you have what we call quarter sawn, where the grain runs perpendicular to the cut, like this. Good, better, best is the easiest way to remember this. So quarter sawn is first price. This is that if you can get all quarter sawn wood, then it's the most stable because it moves the least. So wood moves what they call tangentially. In other words, it actually moves along with the grain. So if your wood wants to expand and contract, in this instance here where it's flat sawn, it actually expands and contracts in this direction. It goes like that. Your planks will become wider and not so wide depending on the temperature, depending on humidity, depending on um, the actual uh, moisture content of the wood. If you've got something that's moving more in this direction, sort of 45 degrees, it's less likely to expand and contract in this along its width. In other words, it's a little bit more stable along its width. Something that's quartz sawn where your wood expands and contracts in this direction, it's incredibly stable in this along its width. So it's actually the most stable kind of wood. Now, how do we get these three cuts out of a log? It's actually quite simple. If you think about the fact that all of our logs are cut like slices like this, so if I'm taking a piece from there, then it's easy to see that what we have here is a flat sawn piece of wood. Our grain is doing exactly that. As we get closer to the center of the tree, you'll see, for example, if I take that piece there, you'll notice that that's more of a 45 degree angle. In fact, over there, it's the same. So you have rift sawn pieces there. So those are rift sawn. That's flat sawn. There are a couple of pieces in every tree, just by virtue of the fact that the middle of the tree is here, where you have quarter sawn woods. In other words, this piece here is pretty much quarter sawn. That piece there is pretty much quarter sawn. Same with this one here and that one there. So if you're thinking about this like, uh, like a butcher, these are the fillet stakes. In other words, these are the best cuts of that tree. This middle stuff over here is not stable at all because that's where the center of the tree was. So you want to try and avoid this bit for making furniture. I mean, it's great for firewood, but that's pretty much what it's good for. If you are going to be taking wood to make a table out of, then you have to try and find as much as possible wood that is either in this category or in this category to make your life easy. It's not to say that you can't use flat sawn wood and oftentimes that's all you have access to, but there are a couple of tricks that you have to use in order to keep your table from turning into a, into like a wavy sort of Simba chip. One of the things you can do here is, let's say I'm doing a tabletop along here and I'm using these planks. If we are only going to use flat sawn wood, if we only have access to flat sawn wood, then the smartest thing you can do to keep your table from bowing or cupping or bending or going out of control or misbehaving is that you can alternate your grain that you have one log going like that, one log going this way. What that does, it evens out the tension between the surfaces here because one wants to bend the other way and one wants to bend the next way and so on and so on. When you look at this here and you want to know in which direction this is going to bend, the easiest way to work it out is to work out which side of the wood would have been the outside of the tree. Now, just beneath the bark of every tree is a thing called the cambium. And that cambium 
is kind of like a sack that keeps everything, all, all the moisture in and what have you. When the tree gets chopped down, the cambium dries out and it actually starts getting tight. So as this gets tight on this side, what will happen is that this will want to start bending in that direction. In other words, your wood will start warping towards the outside of the tree. Now, it seems counterintuitive because you would think that it would warp along with the grain, but actually on the outside is where the moisture is all leaving and it's all getting tighter and it's pulling the wood in that direction. So a flat sawn piece of wood that is in this orientation will end up looking ultimately like that. It'll end up going up and out. It'll actually end up shaping itself like that. So if I know that this is going to go this way and that's going to go that way and this is going to go this way and that's going to go that way, then I can alternate these to make certain that across a wide expanse or a width of a table that I've got the best possible chance of trying to stay flat across the surface. I'm going to clear the board in a second um, and I'll show you guys one of the tricks you can use to get a good result even if you don't have the best cut of wood because basically that's the best cut, that's the second best cut, that's not the greatest cut. It's the most common because of the way we mill wood here. It's the most cost effective way to mill it on a bandsaw. What happens in other parts of the world is quarter sawn wood is created by the way in which the wood is actually being sawn rather than where the grain goes. What I mean by that is they would take a log, slice it that way first, then they'd slice it this way, then one slice here, one slice there, one slice here, one slice there, one slice here, and so on. So now what you're getting is a properly quarter sawn log that gives you this result on every single cut. That's why quarter sawn wood is so expensive because it's hugely labor intensive to do this. Every single cut you make, you have to switch the log around, switch the log around, cut one, switch one, cut one, switch one. There is one way that you can achieve that without having to buy the more expensive cuts of wood. Here is my great big piece of wood. Now it's vastly magnified, but you're gonna get the picture in a second here. If that's my big piece of wood, and I want to get the most stable result out of this piece of wood, we already know that in time what's going to happen is that the wood is going to want to bend in that direction. If we leave it be, there is nothing on this earth that will prevent that from happening. It will happen. You can only try and allow for it when you're building furniture. You can try and bear that in mind. If you want to work with this piece of wood, one of the things you can do is you can cut this piece out in the middle here. This piece is basically rubbish. So we'll take that out. We'll lose a little bit of our width, but we'll have one piece of what is almost rift sawn and another piece that is almost rift sawn. And all you do is you'll take this piece, you'll flip it around, and then you'll join them back together. So you'll have lost a bit of your width, but you'll have rift sawn here. So now you have a much more stable piece of timber to work with. So this is how you get a good result out of a bad situation. You just forego that little bit of wood over there. It might seem like a crazy thing to have to consider because, I mean, how much does wood move? Well, let me give you a practical example. Pine, the structure of pine, let's, let's imagine wood like straws again. Let's go back to the whole thing about straws. So straws uh, have got spaces and they've got walls, right? So like a long, big extruded pipe, that's what a straw is. So if we look at pine, Pine does this. So pine is a small straw, it's a very thick wall, that's pine. Oak looks like this. Okay, so the difference there is that oak has a big straw with a thin wall. Pine has a small straw with a thick wall. And this is the most basic way to put it. I mean, it's more complicated than this, but if we dumb it right down, this is basically what you're looking at. Which means that oak has the ability to be more flexible before it breaks. So if you take oak and, uh, and you flex it, it's a lot more flexible than pine, which will be more brittle and break because you've got a thicker wall here. It also means that your moisture escapes from this one much faster. So a one meter wide table, 100 centimeters wide, if your humidity drops 14% moisture in summer to six or seven or eight percent moisture in winter so that's going to drop a radical amount a one meter wide oak table is going to be 
nearly three centimeters narrower in winter and three centimeters wider in summer. That's 30 mils, it's that much. It's a radical amount, it's a big number. So you've got to think about that when you're starting to do your joinery because you know that this oak table is going to go all over the place. That's why oak is a bit naughty. One of the reasons why, as a furniture maker, I use plywood is that it's a stable base. So I can create veneers or pieces of oak on top of plywood and you have the appearance and the feel and the texture of solid wood, but you have a much more stable structure underneath. So you actually have that attached to the plywood in a way that it looks like solid wood. It's not a thin veneer, it's a maybe a 10 or 12 more piece of oak that is much more compliant than a great big beam of oak, but it allow you to create the illusion of a very thick top because 70 or 60 percent of the thickness of the top is in fact stable plywood, something like birch ply or one of those nice plies that you can put underneath solid wood that will give you the structure and hold things where they should be so that you have less movement. So often in construction of carcasses, cabinets, um, outside furniture, things like that, you find that the wood movement factor becomes so big that it's best to actually use things like plywood underneath solid wood to actually create the best sort of end result. Wood movement is such that you've got to allow for it in almost every kind of joint. I mean, let's take a classic example, just for a giggle. Tongue and groove. Everyone's heard of tongue and groove flooring, right? So that there would be the side of the one board, and here is the side of the other board. The problem with this is that if this board wants to expand and contract in that direction, and this board wants to expand and contract in that direction, guarantee you what's going to happen is that the pressure and the tension between these two boards, if they go in this direction, it's going to lift that. So if you've ever walked in someone's house and they've got wooden floors and there's a bump in the floor, that's what's happening. The two boards are actually forcing against each other and they're lifting up because of the sheer pressure and tension of the wood. The smart way to do your joinery here is to allow for that. So how do you do that? If you consider that wood is a bit like water, it goes where it's easiest to go. So let's redo this from the viewpoint of somebody who understands wood movement. We'll go there and this piece we just cut shorter so that there's actually room for it to expand and contract. So this area where the green is, is the area in which the wood will expand and contract. So come winter, it will contract and this gap here will open. In summer, it will expand and this gap here will close. It won't be able to move here and here because it's got something up against it, but here there's room to wiggle. So the, the wood just finds a way and it goes into this space over here like that. So that's how you allow for it. If this is all solid, then you've got to start thinking along those lines. But the cool part about plywood is that you can make your life a lot easier. So here is some really cool birch plywood. And here is a layer of, let's call it oak, just for the sake of the argument. The bulk and the strength of this plywood is so good that it will remain completely stable. And in doing so, we'll keep that absolutely stable. In our next project, I'm gonna show you guys how to make a coffee table using this method. Where we are, it's humid and we wanna make furniture, but we want to have the look of solid wood, we're going to use an amazing wood called Siberian Larch, which is kind of like an incredibly sexy conifer. It's kind of like a pine plus. It's a really, really nice sort of cut of wood. If you wanna see a practical application of this theory, then uh, somewhere here, there's a link to our video on how to make a coffee table um, using this exact method. So we built a coffee table out of birch ply and Siberian larch, and it has the appearance of a solid wood table, but the brain smarts of a plywood table that doesn't move and go all over the place. So check out that video because I just think it's a cool video, so check it out. Oh. Hmm. Uh-oh.